Great, good, good morning. Well, thank you very much for that uh, introduction, John. And I think it was good to have that very fair account of the financing changes that we introduced. Uh, one could add, and it's relevant for the session that we're about to have, that also out of that £9,000 of fees, approximately £1,000 is taken specifically to be used for spending on access programmes. Access programmes which are now under the overall responsibility of the Office for Students. And indeed, it's great that our first speaker on this panel is Sir Michael Barber, who has recently been appointed Chairman of the Office for Students. And after we've heard from Michael, we'll then hear from Carol Fault, Chancellor of the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Uh, we've then got Sir Nigel Thrift, Executive Director of Schwartzman Scholars, who may be relieved that he is no longer a Vice Chancellor. <laughs> Though, of course, if you want to ask him about Vice Chancellor's pay, that, that preoccupation that's gone through the whole week, I'm sure he'd be happy to oblige. No, I wouldn't really. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're going to try to liberate ourselves from that obsession just for a few minutes. Um, and then we'll hear from Iran Rensberg, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Johannesburg. And I hope then there'll be time for you to ask questions because I think there's a really important practical issue behind all this as to how we reconcile the pursuit of the highest standards of research excellence and the prestige and the rankings that go with that with a different objective of ensuring our universities are open and diverse, which, let's, let's face it, sometimes does not reap rewards in the rankings, and depending on how it's done, can even in some sets of rankings, though not the global times higher rankings, actually pull you down the league tables. So there are some real tensions here that I hope we're going to resolve in the next hour. Let's begin by hearing from Michael Barber. Michael, over to you. Well, thank you, David, and, and thanks, everybody, for, for being here. It's, it's a pleasure to be part of this event, and, and congratulations to the Times Higher for, for putting together such a fantastic event. Um, and uh, I'm delighted to be on a panel with um, Carol from Chapel Hill. I've been to North Carolina, I've been to Chapel Hill. I've seen that whole university system in action. I visited Nigel's uh, university when he was at, uh, vice chancellor at Warwick and I uh, look forward to visiting the University of Johannesburg at some time in the near future. So I'm a, a, a very distinguished panel to be part of. Um, the Office for Students that David mentioned is the new regulator set up by legislation earlier this year that, that, that passed through Parliament in April. Uh, and we haven't even started yet, so legally we, uh, we formally, our, our start date will be the 1st of January 2018. And we're setting up this new regulator to look ahead at the next generation of higher education in England specifically. Um, uh, we will be looking at the quality of teaching uh, and how to improve it. We will be looking at the, um, the, the uh, employability of students as well as their academic standards uh, and a range of other things. And specifically related to this panel, we'll be looking at access success, progression into the uh, labour market and inclusion uh, and that will be an absolutely top priority for us because we're very very keen to see that throughout our work and that's why we're called the office for students we put the interests of students short, medium and long term first so we will take that perspective in regulating the higher education sector and in doing that um, in addition to looking at the things I've talked about we will not underestimate the importance of scholarship, of knowledge for its own sake, and of setting up a regulatory framework that enables Britain's or England's uh, research-intensive universities to continue to succeed, succeed uh, both nationally and on the global stage. So we're, we're balancing, combining, thinking through that agenda, and we're very much focused on the long term. Um, I want to mention... Um, <clears throat> three uh, things that uh, research intensive universities are already doing in England that I think show real promise and that we want to see uh, more of um, over the next, um, the me next few years. I should say for those of you um, outside of the UK, if you want to uh, follow our establishment, we'll be publishing between now and the end of the year um, a, a document on the new regulatory framework, the new regulatory landscape that we want to put in place where we bring that student uh, perspective to bear on the way universities think about the issues that I've just mentioned. Uh, and we'd welcome dialogue, uh, of course, with people 
in the sector we're actually regulating here in England, but also with people around the world, because these are big issues for all of us wherever we are, and we're very keen to learn from the best practice uh, and actually from mistakes that are made wherever they're made uh, in the world. So thank you very much for, for, for that. Please feel free to be part of the debate. Three things I want to mention. One thing that is already beginning to happen, and I must say leaders of universities that I interact with, and I've had the pleasure of visiting a lot of universities in the last few months, uh, is that our university leaders, uh, vice chancellors, but also the, the leadership in general uh, uh, and the academic leadership are very committed to this agenda of access, success, progression into the labour market and inclusion. Uh, I'm very encouraged by that. When I talk to students on campuses, I always uh, sit with students when I visit a university. They too are very committed to, committed to this. So there's no lack of will. It's about finding the ways of doing this that work. And only a relatively small part of that is down to funding and scholarships, important though those things are. So I just want to give you some examples of the kinds of things we're, that, that, that I'm seeing. So one is the active involvement of research-intensive universities in the school system itself. So we're, we, King's College, Ed Byrne is here. King's College is hosting uh, or co-hosting this event. Uh, you're right by the campus. We've got the incoming Vice-Chancellor of, uh, of the London School of Economics here in the room, which is just around the corner as well. Uh, universities like that are beginning to play a significant part in the school system. So uh, King's College now runs a math school for uh, students who have uh, reached the age of 16, done reasonably well in maths, from a very diverse range of backgrounds, many of them uh, from low-income backgrounds. Uh, the results of that math school are truly outstanding. 100% of the students uh, this year got into uh, top research-intensive universities. Um, there, if you look at the value added, uh, we have value added measures of all of our schools in the school system here in England. Uh, they're in the top 0.5% of the value added uh, for uh, any school in the country. Uh, and for many of the students that have, will be starting now or next year if they're having a year, uh, a gap year, will be, it'll be the first in their families ever to have gone to university. This is a tremendous example of the kind of way a research intensive university can actively engage in the school system. King's also did a radical uh, reform of the way they uh, recruited for their medical school when they realized a few years ago that uh, none of the, the, the people getting into the medical school at King's were from the local area. That has been changed now uh, by looking at the access arrangements. I could quote other examples. Exeter University also has a math school which I visited, which is uh, truly uh, excellent. These are just small examples of the way in which research-intensive universities can engage directly in the school system in order to improve access, uh, uh, success, progression and inclusion. Um, a second way they can engage uh, with this uh, whole inclusion agenda is by looking at their entry requirements. In England, uh, traditionally and still very, very strongly, uh, most students get into university according to the A-level grades they achieve. A-level is the end of school examination uh, for most students, although there are also vocational qualifications. But some universities are uh, looking at the entry requirements and saying, well, yes, A-levels are important, but are they the only thing that matter? Can we, can we in some way, through aptitude tests, through interviews, get at potential, uh, not just actual achievement, uh, as a way of encouraging inclusion. Uh, I was, uh, had the, 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 the privilege of uh, sitting next to Louise Richardson at dinner last night. We were talking about some of the schemes that with Oxford colleges are um, experimenting with. So Lady Margaret Hall, a, a distinguished uh, college at Oxford, now has a <coughs> relatively small number of students, but nevertheless it's a, a significant experiment of students coming for an extra foundation year which they're funding students that wouldn't normally have got the A-level entry requirements to get into Oxford. They give them an intensive foundation year to prepare them for the full three-year undergraduate degree at Lady Margaret Hall. That seems to be working, but it's early days yet. Nobody wants to judge it, but it's an exciting experiment. University College Oxford uh, has just added 10% to its student numbers each year. But instead of taking those extra 10% on the same basis as the the 90% the, the that have already got in, they're taking those 10% of students from disadvantaged backgrounds who just missed the cut on entry requirements. So it's a specific way of 
bringing those people over the line into University College Oxford. Again, it's an experiment. Again, the numbers are relatively uh, uh, small, but it's an exciting development. And Oxford also has a summer school with 765, if I uh, remember correctly, students every year uh, experiencing Oxford during a summer school before they go to university. But, but large numbers of those students do, in fact, end up getting into Oxford and, again, going on to do reasonably well. So there, that, I just take one university, because I happen to be sitting next to a, a distinguished vice chancellor from there yesterday, that shows how, by thinking imaginatively, we can experiment in the area. And I think one of the things the Office for Students will want to see is that commitment that universities have being turned into real experimentation and learning from which individual universities can benefit, but all of us can benefit across the system. And we will want to encourage best practice. We certainly won't want to impose a given single model across such a diverse sector, but we will want to see that commitment being turned into real experimentation and learning and uh, genuine improvement. And as David Willits was saying, in his, or, or, or John Gill was saying in the opening remarks, we've seen really big progress over the last five or six years. So this is not a, a desert. This is something where we've already got momentum. The percentage of students coming from the bottom quintile has actually uh, doubled in the five years since the funding reforms came in, or, or, or roughly. Um, the third area that we will... So, so the first area was about... Um, a, direct involvement in the school system. The second is about looking at entry requirements. The third one is about quality of teaching. One of the things the Office for Students will do is regulate the quality of teaching through the teaching excellence framework. The first results of that were published this year. That was prior to the Office of Students being, uh, being established. Uh, but getting into a range of metrics that in some way get at the quality of teaching, but without an inspection system and certainly without imposing any single model of what good teaching looks like. But the teaching excellence framework, as it evolves, and uh, people in the sector will hear more about that from the, the Minister of Higher Education, who is making a speech later this week, um, will increasingly encourage universities to demonstrate how their teaching is encouraging access, success and progression uh, into university, through university and beyond university. And the metrics we look at will encourage universities to think about how their teaching is enabling students to succeed, to graduate, not to drop out, to go on and get good worthwhile work uh, in the labour market. Uh, so that will be uh, an important aspect of the way we encourage this. And then the fourth thing and final thing I'll say is we are increasingly in this country, and it will be part of the Office for Student Responsibility, looking at the data about progression after university. So already through the... Uh, uh, um, a statistical set called Delhi, we can see how well students are doing uh, six months after they leave university. Uh, we will take that uh, and move it on to look at 15 months after. We also have another data set where we've got long, uh, the, the, the progression of students using individual student data from schools, from universities, and then the labour market. We can look at how well students are doing one year, three years, and five years after they left university. That, that data set is called LEO. Uh, the first set of that was published in July. That will be published regularly. So students will have information on which to base decisions about which programmes, which universities, which courses enable them to progress in different ways into the labour market. And I should say, when we look at the labour market, it's not just about how much you earn, it's about what kind of work you do. Uh, we will want to encourage students to go into teaching or some of the other professions, or to charitable work. It's not just about whether you can get a good job in the city, but that's uh, good if you can, if that's what you want to do. But we'll look at a diverse things. It's not just about the income you earn. So these things, direct involvement in the school system, looking at entry requirements, looking at the quality of teaching, looking at progression beyond university, and not thinking it's enough for students to get into university. They've got to succeed while they're there with the relevant support. And they've got to succeed after they leave so that we become... Here I'm talking about the university sector, an engine of social mobility as well as of high quality research. Thank you very much, Michael. Very interesting. And I think that final point in particular captures a way in which the debate in England is opening up. And it will be interesting when we get to discussion to see how much this is happening elsewhere. Because of, in some ways, rather worrying evidence that, well, the good news is that students from disadvantaged backgrounds can get to leading research-intensive universities and perform at least as well, indeed on some measures, better than students from more advantaged backgrounds. But even if they then get the same degree qualification, 
If we then track them out into the labour market, it looks as if their earnings are lower than those of students from more advantaged backgrounds, even if they have equivalent academic qualifications. And that is part of the thinking behind the legal framework which Michael was describing, where in the past, access spend was entirely focused on intake and getting the students in. Now there's a broader regime for access spend, which will include programs that, for example, could help a university fund an unpaid internship for a disadvantaged child, which in the past only a student with a parents with a flat with a spare bedroom in London would have been able to enable that student to participate in. So we're now looking indeed, as Michael said in his final comment, and I hope in the discussion we might see if there's international experience to share on that. Anyway, let's now turn to Carol, Carol Fault uh, from the University of North Carolina, part of a very exciting research triangle, which like Michael, I've had the privilege of visiting. Over to you, let's hear from you. Great, thank you. And I too want to say thank you to the people from King's College and Times Higher Ed. You know, it's wonderful for all of us to have a chance to come and listen to each other. Uh, it really is exciting and, and I've been learning so much and it's great to be here. The question, one of the questions we were posed was a question, can elite research intensive universities be accessible to all and still thrive? And I think we'd say a resounding, if we don't do that, we will not thrive. In fact, we will fail. So I think that's the real question here, is not whether we want to be diverse and inclusive. It really is how do great universities do that and really help the students from all possible backgrounds have access to the best that we have to offer. So it's a great opportunity to talk about that. I noticed yesterday when Ed began his talk, one of the things he said is that universities must be, indeed they are drivers of social mobility. And I think we've all taken that on as part of our mission. And I'm not sure we would have all said that quite so directly in the past. In fact, in the States, people have started to talk about access to high quality education as another civil right. And that starts changing and intensifying our purpose around these. I noticed when Phil talked about his own story being first in his family to go to university, we have these amazing stories of people who have come from every background and how it's changed their lives. So we sit in universities that have such a focus on high quality students, amazing research, and we're trying to say how do we do our share uh, in creating a world for our economies and our, our um, talent pools that come from our universities. I'll give some specific examples in a moment, but my last sort of general thought is that it is in fact the research universities that should be doing this because we're very good at preparing people not for the jobs of today, we do that too, but we're really focusing on preparing people to create the jobs, the ideas of tomorrow. And that's where the diversity that comes from our full background, the, the melting pots that our universities are, that's where that has to come from. So not only is that what we thrive on, we need that, those voices to do it. Now, in the States, we have a very different set of funding models, and some of our issues, a large part of them, have to do with getting affordable, high-quality education for people. Not cookie-cutter, conveyor-belt education, but true experiential education, working with great faculty at cutting-edge research universities. So we have lots of ideas about how to change our funding models. Chapel Hill is always the school that ends up on the top of every ranking that looks for low cost, high value because we have low tuition, we've kept it low, we have high, second highest graduation rates of all public universities and we're top 10 research universities. So some big part of that has been that our state has continued to help subsidize our education system. We have about 20% to 25 come from first gen families and we have programs like the one called the Carolina Covenant, been adopted by other states that take kids that come, or students that come from fa families that make two standard deviations below the poverty level. So these are families in American dollars that are making about $25,000 a year, and we guarantee them graduation loan free. So I think that's a different take, and their graduation rates in that program have closed entirely the income gap in graduation rates. So that 
is a really important part. They have to be able to afford it. But we've also started doing things, I think you've really been talking about, that have become uh, countrywide, where we are getting out into the K-12 system. So one of the things I think we all share is this belief that we need to help students that may not see themselves as going to Oxford or King's College or UNC Chapel Hill. They don't think that's where they belong. We need to have them start believing that they can be successful there. So there's a program that was developed, started at Carolina, and it's now in 40 states, called the Advising Corps. We take recent graduates, we pay for them, and they go into high schools and they spend the count, they become the college counselors. And just to give you an example of how powerful this is, we have these uh, students in um, 80 of the 100 poorest high schools in the state of North Carolina, but they're across the country. What, prior to, go, to having one of these counselors there, this is a student often that comes from the same background, can really talk to students in a very different way. In one of these schools I just visited last year, 37% of the students even thought about going to college. And most of them were, were just thinking about it. Within one year, the first year the counselor was there, 87% of the students applied. Every one of them was able to fill out uh, um, financial aid application, and they were all going to one school or another. What that tells me is that they all want to go. These stories that we hear about people are disillusioned by higher education, I don't really buy them mm. that much because every time we go out where students don't go, they want to go. So that's an example. They get support. Another example of something that really works is that we go out into the community colleges, and if those are our two-year version of universities, and if students sign up and are accepted in their first year and graduate with high marks, they're automatically given entry into the university, and they graduate once they transfer at the same level. So I think it's all of our universities getting out into the community, finding new ways to get a bigger and a much more diverse audience. The second piece is when they come, I think we all know this, that it's that early advising that's important. And there is so much data that shows this. So we do these summer programs like you were mentioning at Oxford. We do those many. I'm sure they do them at many universities. I see uh, people from Berkeley here. I know they do a lot of these summer programs. But the difference if they have strong advising in the first year is enormous for their success. And it's a lot to do with the, not the fact that they aren't capable, but they've got family pressures back home. People are saying, we need you. They're often people who are helping support families. And they need advisors to say, stick with it. You can do it. You can make it. And their graduation rates, if they can stay within the first year, if you can get that success up to 95% in the first year, then their graduation and success also ends up closing the gap. So it's this combination of keeping costs low, building the appetite and the belief that you can actually come, and then making sure when you're there, the access is important. The last piece is, and this is maybe peculiar to American universities, but I doubt it. Many of our low income or first gen or students that are, are underrepresented, students come to universities and they don't take advantage of all the extras. They don't do the study abroad programs. They don't get the internship. They don't go work in the Nobel laureate's laboratory. And so I think that's the other piece that the research intensive universities with access to different kinds of funds have to do is to make sure that not only are we getting them in and even graduating them, but to have them have that same success afterwards, putting them into the most mm -hmm. high intensity extras that we have to offer. And so those are the ones I've seen good examples, and I think you all probably have them for how they work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carol. Before I turn to Nigel, can I just ask you one specific question? Because this may be something that other vice chancellors in the room wrestle with, which is how your behavior affects the rankings. Because certainly we have in the UK some ranking systems where one of the elements in the ranking is the prior attainment of the students going to the university. So if you take students who may have lower qualifications, even if you think they've got great potential, it affects you in the ranking. How do the US World Report rankings work on that? And you is know, that a dilemma you're aware of? Well, it, it, it is a dilemma, and I'll make two points about it. If we take our Carolina Covenant, the low income and first gen, out of our entering class, our uh, academic ranking, our academic numbers actually get worse. 
And I think this is really important. Diversity does not come with low quality. There are many, and again, we don't have the same A level. We have very different ways. We have 24 different metrics that we use in admissions. And in fact, Caroline and Harvard are being taken to the Supreme Court to question some of our ways that we look at diversity. But it is more, I think, for us that we have more than half our students are not even looking at university, and there is an enormous talent pool out there. The second thing is the, the rankings are diversifying. So Kiplinger, which is the one where I was mentioning value, actually looks at um, what income level you come from and how well you are taking people from one income level to another income level. So we're really trying to diversify our own belief about what can make a student successful. And that grit and determination that you were mentioning is starting to show up, I believe, in the numbers. Once in, the success rates are actually getting very strong. Right, thank you very much. Now, Nigel, Nigel Thrift, who was Vice Chancellor of Warwick University in the UK, now based in New York as the Executive Director of Schwarzman Scholars. Over to you, Nigel. Thanks, David. And thank you to Times Higher Ed and to um, Kings for the opportunity to, to speak here. Um, I'm going to talk mainly about undergraduates, as everyone else has, but I will talk a little bit about master's students mm. as well, because that's an important aspect mm. of this, and becoming more important in terms of inequality, actually. Um, so there's a lot to be upbeat about. Let me be very clear about this. Uh, in all sorts of ways, we've already heard instances of fantastic progress being made in terms of inclusion. Um, but I want to kind of not rain on the parade, but maybe a small shower <laughs> uh, might be the best way of putting it, in the sense that we're doing this against a headwind, which is very, very strong structurally around the world. Uh, and... Um, you only have to look at some of the figures uh, more generally when it particularly comes to elite research intensive universities. There's what's already become a famous New York Times article uh, recently showing that the proportion uh, of African Americans and Latinos uh, entering elite universities has not actually increased in the US since 1980. Uh, so there is still quite a lot of work to do let me put it that way. And I think one of the reasons for this is genuinely structural. Uh, it is that all of these efforts conflict with another trend which is going on, and that is that universities are also there to produce elites. Uh, and we're trying to do two things at once, and that is very, very um, interesting, I suppose, is perhaps the, the best way of putting it. Um, it's a balancing act. Uh, universities want to be elite, <coughs> at the same time they want to be inclusive, and those two things don't always actually add up. Um, and one of the reasons for that is, I think, because uh, uh, the spread of university education has actually encouraged uh, what one can best describe as middle-class activism uh, in a very, very strong way, a very strong way. Um, I'm taking um, in particular the work of Elizabeth Currid Halkett, which probably a number of people will know about. Uh, but she talks about the way in which um, what was a leisure class of relatively well off people who were not that bothered about education because they believed they were going, their kids were going to get into university anyway, uh, suddenly find themselves uh, having to invest in their kids' education in a pretty serious way. Uh, and increasingly, if you look at the figures in the US and indeed elsewhere, I had a quick scan through what figures I could find in the UK, um, you find that um, middle-class parents have moved away from conspicuous consumption of one kind or another to what Currid Halkett calls inconspicuous consumption. Uh, that is, massive investments in their children massive investments, spending on kitting out middle-class children to be able to garner and hoard prized and rare educational opportunities. Um, uh, I've been in New York, and anyone who, I think, I, I can't tell you, but at, uh, education for the middle class in New York basically starts at day zero and moves on as far as I can make out. Um, uh, they realize they are in a race, and they are going to win it. Um, and to, to, to give some sense of proportion to this, in the US, the top 10% now allocate almost four times as much spending to school and university as they did in 1996. 
The figures are not as strong as that in the UK, but they're not far off it, actually. Uh, and I think we have to be very aware that this countercurrent is going on the whole time. And it's a more difficult countercurrent because, quite legitimately, the middle class can argue that they are getting into university on the educational merit of their children. Uh, so, in a sense, uh, you can see, therefore, why they then get aggrieved when they feel that their position is being unfairly challenged by people who have not got in on what they see as merit. Um, and, in a sense, what we have done is we have produced, I think, over the last uh, 15, 20 years, probably one of the most dreaded things, in some ways, for social mobility, which is a meritocracy. Um, uh, Michael Young, years and years ago, talked about the problems you get uh, in meritocracies, that they actually cement people's positions uh, rather than the reverse. Uh, and we've already seen a reaction taking place in all sorts of ways in this country. Um, John Gray talks about what he calls middle-class populism uh, in this country. Uh, and that has been based around, I think, in particular, the issue of tuition fees. But we're going to see more and more of that as these people who've invested this vast amount in the education of their children feel that it is threatened. Uh, I think we should just be realistic about this. Uh, and if I was one of those people, and I'm not anymore, my children are, are grown up and long past, I'd probably be feeling the same thing, if I'm honest. I think we have to be uh, frank about these kind of things. Um, so there is a genuine difficulty here uh, that has to be got round. I don't know how to do that. Uh, but it requires uh, much more careful messaging, I think, than has been the case in the past. Uh, there is a genuine sense, I think, of threat uh, that you get when these kinds of things actually happen. Um, going on from that, what can we do about it? There are so many different schemes uh, embracing inclusion that I don't think I want to add any more instances. One thing I would like to see, though, is universities getting more control over this than they actually have at the moment. Just uh, for a while, there was talk of uh, universities actually getting some control of their budgets by moving the money out to each individual university. And uh, at least a couple of American universities have been uh, experimenting indirectly with this, Purdue and others, with so-called income sharing schemes. Uh, and I would like to see something like that because it would give universities more ability to direct the way they do things than they actually have uh, at the moment. We're a long way off doing that kind of thing. So, that's undergraduates. I then want to go on to uh, a, a group of people where actually um, inequality is greater, and that is master's students. Um, and actually, in many ways, that is something which is as important to think about. Now, the government here has done some good things, because it extended the loan scheme, uh, and so on and so forth, so that uh, master's students can access it. But this is where I think debt really does cut in. Uh, I think for people from less well-off backgrounds, uh, the idea that they're going to take on even more debt to do another one or two years of master's course actually is a deterrent. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Uh, and yet, at the same time, master's courses are becoming a key differentiator in particular areas, specifically professional master's courses in business, in law, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so... Those are the two main points I want to make, but the question is how do research-intensive universities embrace inclusion? They also have to look in their own backyard a bit more as well. Um, so look at all the other ways in which this needs to be done. Uh, look, for example, at doctoral students. Uh, and again, you see systematic biases. Um, look at contract researchers, you see systematic biases. Um, Look even then at who actually gets jobs in elite universities, and boy, do you see some systematic biases. Um, so this is really headwind stuff. It's fantastic what's being done, fantastic. But I did want to point out that there are some genuine structural issues, uh, uh, and where we think we're aiming towards may not be quite where we will actually get to as a result of that. That's all I want to say. Thank you very much, Nigel. And that was a very... 
That rang, rings very true as a vivid account of the arms race we now have in educational attainment and the intensity with which this arms race is accelerating both uh, in Britain and in many other countries. Now, it's marvellous that we've got Aaron Rensberg, Vice-Chancellor of the University of Johannesburg. Many of these issues of access, of course, particularly highly charged in the South African environment where there are some fantastic universities that I've had the privilege of visiting. And Aaron, we very much look forward to your comments. Uh, good morning, David. Um, and uh, like my fellow panellists, many thanks uh, to our colleagues and friends in Times Higher and, of course, to our good friend Ed uh, and uh, King's College. It's a, it's a very special privilege always to be a part of, of these conversations uh, that enrich um, and um, inspire and um, uplift us uh, at the same time. Um, so looking then at, at South Africa um, and Africa more generally, um, given that uh, a good friend of us, Raj uh, Kumar, spoke yesterday about India and uh, its significant influence in the next uh, generation, um, it, it's worth reminding us that the African population, which currently sits in the region of 1.3 billion, uh, is expected to rise by 2030 to 2.2 billion and by 2070 to 4.4 billion. And so for every 10 citizens by then, 4.4 will be African. I think it's worth contemplating um, that scenario. And so two generations from today, we expect to have a significant African population, currently 53 nation states. Um, these will be predominantly young folk, um, younger than 35 years old, and so we can choose a path of inclusion or one of elitism. If one looks at the um, growth of the post-school system <clears throat> across the continent of Africa in the last um, 15, 20 years, we've moved from a, a thoroughly elite system, 6% participation level. Um, we've doubled that to about 12% as we speak, and we expect this growth to continue so that by 2040, we will have approximately a 30% participation level. Um, and hopefully at the same time, uh, we will see the building of the, the technical and vocational college system. The, the difficulty with this growth <coughs> that we're observing in, in, in Africa, and for that matter across um, the developing um, nations across the world, um, is that there is a demand for any form of post-school education, good or bad, for profit or public or private, whichever is available. Um, uh, the supply has grown significantly, in particular of low quality for profits, offering um, what seems to be the equivalent of a university education. And so what we are seeing evolving across the continent of Africa, with few exceptions, um, is the entrapment of the poorest who rely on prospects of future income to finance their post-school education with high interest yielding loans obtained from micro-lenders. In essence, the poorest are trapped at the bottom of this dual system of high quality, modestly priced, well-articulated post-school education for the middle classes and the political and economic elites, and another high price, poor quality, and institutionally and economically disarticulated post-school education for the urban and for the rural poor. As you will be aware, in, in the instance of South Africa, we are at the precipice um, of a major reform in the cost-sharing model for university education. Uh, in 2015, we had the new generation of leaders, of activists, uh, shaking the public university system in South Africa, and for that matter, into last year, demanding in the first instance free education, um, and in the second instance, if that's not possible, free education for the poor, um, and a cost-sharing model, um, uh, conti income contingent uh, model for for the so-called missing middle, those with incomes above $10,000 a year who do not qualify 
for state aid. So that, that gives you an idea where state aid cuts off in South Africa. Anything, uh, any family income, annual income above $10,000 and you're knocked out of the system simply because there is not enough funding. And so we at that critical point, this, the Commission of Inquiry has presented their report to the President um, and we expect um, uh, possibly all help to break loose again <laughs> in the next month or, or so. Um, and so all of us uh, as vice chancellor looking uh, at this, we obviously um, playing the role that we should be playing and seeking to influence the situation. So what, what are the, um, uh, the questions and issues therefore that face us given that I believe that patterns or more precisely foundations are emerging for a major generation long quality and values push and for the nurturing certainly on the African continent of an inclusive, innovation-led, and sustainable post-secondary education system, and for that matter, for inclusive and sustainable democracies. These two go hand in hand. It seems to me, given uh, the drama that is unfolding across our continent, uh, for nation states, we have little choice but to introduce soft regulation focused on remedying poor quality, price uh, um, uh, uh, and, and, and career disarticulation um, uh, in, indeed, as the Chinese saying go, we have to lift all boats by lifting the ocean. Um, it will require money, of course. But it seems to me states can no longer simply observe um, as they're observing. Um, secondly, for us, the so-called apex or elite publics and not-for-profits, um, we have to be the change. We have to model good intentions. We have to model the public and the common good. We must engage robustly with and contest the idea or the received truth, uh, uh, and I appreciate, Nigel, your intervention about the pushback, uh, the received truth that we are elite institutions that are distant or detached. Um, and uh, one way to, 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 um, uh, to respond to this is to agree enrolled targets or enrollment targets. Um, say, for example, a modest target of 20% of our enrollment, our first year enrollment, coming from the poorest 40% at zero tuition, possibly, to very low tuition, um, ideally funded through national financial aid schemes or endowments. I believe this is a preferred route rather than the one that explicitly or implicitly makes the statement that the post-school education of these, the weakest economically amongst us, is not ours, but the responsibility of another group of institutions, solely the ones that have the least resources to redress this fact of history and the ones that are for profit, serving up some of the worst post-school education available on the continent of Africa. I turn to the example of, of my university where we seek to model uh, what we call the ancient African tradition of Ubuntu, the idea of ongoing self-realization of oneself through others and the enhancement of the self-realization of, of others, of caring for and of lifting up the weakest amongst us. As we put it, for these are our neighbors and my neighbor's child is my child. And so given that worldview and that ancient African philosophy, um, we have moved, and I will stop in one minute, uh, we have uh, grown our undergraduate uh, student population, uh, the share, of young people coming from the bottom 40% in terms of economic income grouping. We've grown it from 8% to 31% over the last seven to eight years. And so you can see it's not an equitable model, it's almost an equal, equal model of, of participation in the institution. The fact though is that these are children coming from the poorest of the poor. Practically, what does that mean? By the middle of the month, in these households, there is no food. What does a mother do when there is no food? She goes to the local store that now not only sells chicken, but sells the skin and the fat of chicken, and she cooks that for the next 15 days uh, with a porridge to support her children. These are the children that we're mapping into the experience of our university. And as a consequence, it is radically changing the manner in which we are embracing diversity. Um, so for example, 
um, as we speak, uh, the university provides food to 8,000 students twice a day. It's not a traditional role of a university. It's a new role of the university. We provide 3,500 tutors and senior tutors to back our undergraduate students to make headway through the university. Again, not a traditional role of a research intensive or an aspirant research intensive university. Now, I can continue, but I believe it's time to stop. I stop by saying that the university has also had the challenge of transforming its academic community. A major post-apartheid democracy project. And we moved our black academic staff from 150 to over 500 black academic staff. In the period, we've increased our research output fivefold. In a ranking released two weeks ago, which shall be nameless, the university <laughs> emerged as the fifth strongest university on the continent. And so I believe it is possible for us to pursue this agenda that we're talking about, research intensive universities embracing inclusion without us being dragged down, um, quote unquote, dragged down in the rankings. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anne. Of course, the only ranking that counts is the one that's going to appear in the next few hours. <laughs> but uh, anyway, there may be one or two others as well. Uh, you just referred in passing to the next stage of the... South African policy debate about financing your universities. Would you just like to add, in a couple of minutes, when you said it's sort of all hell will break loose next month, just take us through what you think will be the next stage of the South African debate. So our reading of the um, Presidential Commission's advice to the President um, is the construction of a British-modelled income-contingent loan scheme. We think if that is going to be the way forward, all hell will break loose. Because the demand that has been made very clear in these last 24 months has been minimally. The poorest amongst us should receive free education, conditionally, of course, on making good progress and completing their qualification on time. And it is a position which the vice chancellors in our university system fully support and fully back. For those amongst us with family incomes above $15,000 a year. Um, and it, so the idea is to raise the cutoff from $10,000 to $15,000 family income per year, very low still. But for those be, between $15,000 and $20,000, $25,000, $30,000 family income, the construction of um, a combined loan um, and grant scheme, um, graduating from those at the bottom end, full grant, across to a full loan scheme at the top end. Because these are the folk who are not bankable, who are unable to get the kind of loans that would enable them to build the capital um, that needs to be built, the social cultural capital, for the next two, three, five generations. So our sense is that um, it is the latter that, that could buy us time for the next decade. Um, the former, the idea of an income contingent grant, we think may not um, settle the university system as we would love for it to be settled in the next two to three years, the next decade or so. Yes, yes, Just a quick comment. In the States, it doesn't seem to be going towards income contingent either. The movement there is more towards free education. Um, you're, I don't know what that really is going to mean, but you are seeing a movement towards tuition free or most of the privates and most of the research intensive elite of the publics have income, low income students with no, like I was telling that covenant program where there is no loan. And those have shown themselves to be very successful where they exist at narrowing those achievement gaps. But the big public systems are moving towards no tuition. So they're, they're picking a different move than the income contingent. Um, model right now. Mm -hmm. And this is interesting. Of course, here we have, we would argue that if the payments subsequently, as after you've graduated, depend on your earnings and you only pay back as a right. portion of earnings and a, above a threshold, that itself is a quite a progressive way oh, of progressive is, yeah. financing higher education. Mm -hmm. Now, we have got uh, a quarter of an hour or so, and let's see if there are uh, people who wish to put questions or ask comments of our 
panel, and we have the, yes, the lady right beside you. There's the first gentleman there. Wants to, yes? And if you could give your name and organization, please, that'd be fantastic. I mean, there's an University of Kurdistan. Uh, the other day in the morning, I heard one of the UK vice chancellors talking about a two-year graduate course. And his argument was that uh, he could shrink the education into two years, whereby reducing all the breaks the students are having, you know, Easter, uh, Christmas, midterms, summer break. I would like to have the view of the panel on how would that impact the, the, the basic concept of university to be an arena for developing the student, his, you know, his uh, social life and everything else. And whether that is justifiable under the current you know, financial constraint whereby parents are really uh, enduring heavy costs to get their children to education. Right, and of course, especially for research intensive universities, issue about staff time and, and time for research. So now, not everybody needs to comment, but does anybody have a strong view on that question and wish to address it? Yes. I, I, um, it's, a, it's a very good point. And the, I, I think what we, we will want to see in, in England under the new regulatory framework is the development of a diverse range of undergraduate programmes. So we, England generally, there's a standardised three-year degree programme, a few uh, four-year degrees, but basically the three-year degree programme is, is tried, tested, and on the whole works rather well. Um, but in the current funding climate, in the, um, the fast-changing world, if you can get a concentrated good degree in two years, uh, that would be a good innovation. Uh, similarly, if you want to spread your degree over a period of time and work in between times, that would be a good option. So I think what we'll want to see is a diversification, not a shift from one model to another. But universities that want to experiment with two-year degrees, that's clearly financially easier for the student to manage. And if they can achieve, I, I agree with what you said, if you can get the intensity of the university experience into that two years, let's see that happen. I, so I'd be in favour of that, but not as an alternate, not as the single alternative model, but as one of a range of different models. So I, I think it, it will be one of the many experiments we'll see. Yes, Karen. I'll take a sl I, I agree completely. <clears throat> it should be diversified. We have to have a lot of opportunities. But I'm going to just say one argument for the idea that I think that one of the things that's advantageous in universities and the elite institutions are the extracurriculars that we do yeah. offer. And I think, I find it really sad to think that the lowest income students will not have those same advantages. And I think we will do a disservice if we don't, you know, that's what I was sort of saying, the cookie cutter degree is not what I want to replace that for people who can't afford it. So I do like the diversification, but I think we have to fight hard to keep the quality high and find a better way to, to fund that. Yeah, I mean, I absolutely agree with Michael that uh, a diversity of approach is great, but the one problem with two-year degrees is that um, it might be the less well-off people who end up, if you like, ghettoized in those mm -hmm. degrees, and presumably you're not aiming for that. Yeah, so the, these, are, these are important points, and the, the, what, what we will do, and we've got some great data in the US, uh, it's on the UK higher education system, uh, taking individual students through school, through university, into the labor market. So whenever there's an experiment, we will be looking at data, seeing what happens and learning from it. So we want to see experimentation, but by definition, not all experiments will work, but we need to test it against Nigel's and Carol's points. I'd have a modest forecast that in England, you're more likely to see the growth of four-year degree courses than two-year degree courses. And indeed, when we were talking about access, some of the examples, like the programmes we do at King's and Medical Students, or the one at Oxford, were about adding a foundation year. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and England, Britain has some of the world's youngest graduates anyway, I would have thought here. It's a matter of adding more rather than compressing. But let us, we, we must get some other interventions in. Yes, gentlemen there, and the mic is on its way over to you, sir. Yep. Thank you very much for this distinguished panel. Uh, my question is to Professor Rensberg as well as uh, uh, Chancellor Kairal. Uh, I think most of us will agree that we need to ensure inclusion. The big challenge with regard to inclusion in both developed and developing societies is the need for matching and meeting the resource expectations with regard to the opportunities that are going to be made available for giving that full experience of a university. So the question really is that while at one level we have the Times Higher Education and rankings organizations treating universities across different 
social and economic context similarly, because at the end of the day, they are measuring on the basis of performance, at, at what point of time universities will make public policy choices with regard to determining that they will favor access over some other equally important value. And I ask this question simply because of the fact that at the ground reality level of the large part of the developing world, universities are constantly made to make or asked to make those choices. And yeah. they have favored in the context of making choices relating to access and inclusion. And in that process are hugely deprived of the opportunities that are available with regard to promoting what we would call as excellence. So the question is, yeah. is there a moral choice that universities are forced to make all the time when they decide that they will prefer inclusion over some other equally important value. Yeah, a very good question. And I, we have uh, here in the audience Phil Beatty, who of course might at some point wish to comment on how access type criteria are treated in times higher rankings. Now, I think, Aaron, you were one of the people that that question was addressed to. Any observations? Yes, it's a, it's a very important question. Um, I just think that um, uh, we, we need to be cautious with the obsession of rankings. Um, I think that, that we serve a far greater purpose than, than to be preoccupied with, with what, you know, where we stand in the rankings. Um, I, I, I do think that there is, there is room for a different kind of ranking. I think it's fair to say that the, 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 the manner in which the 500 top 500 universities um, uh, are ranked, it is to determine which universities have a research intensity of a particular kind. It, I think that there is room for a, a ranking system um, uh, that focuses on those of us who have a teaching um, a role, a primary focus on the teaching mission. Obviously, many of us operate between those. We operate uh, those models at, at the same time. Um, and, and then on the resource issue, um, I must concede that in, in the instance of my university, between 6 and 8% of our operating budget could be spent on driving our research intensity even more so. Right? Um, but it seems to me that 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 may well be a vanity, a set of vanity initiatives, right? As opposed to the six to eight percent of the operating budget going to teaching and learning initiatives of the kind that I referred to earlier, providing for our first year class of 11,000 undergraduates, um, providing them with the tools to succeed, such as electronic um, e-tablets, loaded with e-books, and there's some controversy obviously there, uh, providing those three and a half thousand, the poorest economically amongst us, with those kinds, providing three and a half thousand tutors and senior tutors. Um, and so I think the, the, the choice is a choice that must be informed about where we find ourselves and what role we play in nurturing our democracies, nurturing social inclusion um, as we nurture our institutions. So I'll just caution against an obsession with, with rankings. Now, Ken, would you like to comment? And also, in your comments, would you comment as well on where the American policy on access is heading? You referred briefly to this uh, Supreme Court case. <laughs> there is a view among some Brits that as uh, ethnic uh, and racial quotas are struck down in the US, America finally has to confront social class instead and use that as a backdrop for university recruitment. Is that the way things are going to go in the US? You might comment on that as well. Well, just a few things. <laughs> um, I, I go back to the idea about how do we do the resources and how do we pay for this. I, I just fundamentally do not believe that um, talent has anything to do with wealth or any other of our, our metrics. That's why I don't believe if you become more diverse, you have to sac sacrifice your quality. I think our job really is to seek out the talent everywhere and find their way to the places where they can really thrive. 
So I do think that is on us. I do think there's a moral imperative for us to do a better job, to reach out, to, to diversify our applicant pools. You know, I get 45,000 applications for 4,000 spot, 4, 4, spots. So there are people out there. I think we can do things there. In the United States, the affirmative action has really changed. There's no quotas. I mean, that's been gone forever. We aren't allowed to do that. But we have a different way of looking at diversity. And we can look at it through background. You can look at it through socioeconomic. You can look at it by religion. You have many different ways of doing it. The real question, I think, goes back to what people are saying is, is it even fair to do it that way? Because we don't have a set of single tests. And in fact, most people think the single test sets are also very biased as well. If you do the SAT or something, it's shown lots of background bias. So we're all, I think, trying to figure out how do you know quality of an 18-year-old or, or someone who's just coming in? And I think it is our moral imperative to do a better job to find it. And so if that means offering different pathways in, letting a mother who's been working and has 10 kids, I have a new freshman that's coming in with nine children, went to a community college, found her way back, is going to get into that amazing university. That's the kind of thing I think we need to do. But it does cost money. So in America, we, we rely heavily on philanthropy. So those top 30, 50 universities are often ones whose alumni are the people who are really paying for all those programs. So the funding model is dependent on generosity back. And of course, that has other implications, it's not so much by the state. So, you know, these aid-based programs shouldn't come at the sacrifice of research. They have to come from a different pot to be able to make us do those ethical uh, designs. The Supreme Court is questioning whether we can use anything other than potentially socioeconomic background as a, mm -hmm. as a part of our admissions. Mm -hmm. And where do you think this is heading? And with the Trump administration's potential challenges as well? I do think it's heading in a direction of socioeconomic. Um, and, and I think for many people, that's a very yeah. important way to think about it. But they wouldn't want to give up on that entirely, because they do know that people bring these amazing backgrounds. But you know, the amount of um, favoring that goes to any one aspect of an identity is pretty tiny when it comes down to it. Yeah. Michael? I just want to um, pick up some things Nigel said earlier and related to what Carol's just been saying. So I, I, I want to put on the record that I think the, the master's students and that being the one of the next frontiers of this equity and inclusion uh, and, uh, and high quality uh, debate is really important. Secondly, I want to pick up and reinforce Carol's point about diversity and quality going together. Um, I think we have to believe that as a, as a moral starting point and then demonstrate it through our actions and through the evidence that we will collect. But we, we're doing that in an era, as Nigel said, of, of, uh, of uh, quoting John Gray, of middle class populism. Uh, and in those circumstances, um, two things I think are important. One is on the funding issue, we can only get uh, really towards equity uh, by lifting the numbers cap on the number of students getting mm -hmm. into university. And if you are funding it out of annual treasury budgets, you can't do that. You would have to have a numbers cap. It's a really important point. So that income contingent loans only paid back when you're earning money is actually a very equitable way uh, uh, being able to drive that and forward. And Michael, you're going to say that to your friend Andrew Adonis, aren't you? Uh, I, uh, not only am I, I have. Um, and, uh, uh, Keep on and, at it. <laughs> uh, and, uh, the, 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 but the last point I want to make, which um, Carol's uh, state represents perfectly, is you only get these big changes where there is bold, courageous political leadership. And uh, North Carolina benefited from 16 years of the governor Jim Hunt, one of the great Americans of the 20th century, still uh, happily alive and well. Uh, but his governorship of North Carolina transformed that state over that period of time. And we, uh, all of us who work in the university sector, we need to be looking for that kind of leadership for the future. Nigel? I was, I was only going to say one thing. I've, I've always been slightly surprised by the number of um, uh, elite universities in the UK that are growing quite substantially. But I can think of a reason why they should do that, and that would be that actually they could then say, look, these places will still be there, come what may, but any increment we have, we will give to other groups. Yeah. Uh, and I can see ways in which that would 
be able to be played, let me put it that way, uh, and without causing too much of a backlash. So there are some interesting things around that, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, it's been a fascinating discussion. We've now got to half past ten. I think you've, you've heard some really important themes. And, and just picking out one theme, which is, which is relevant for the kind of academic values that people in this room stand for, is that I think something we envy in the US is the quality of the data and the way in which researchers like Raj Chetty and others have really given us a granular picture of people's different routes through school and college and to university. And as Michael rightly said, uh, we are just beginning now in Britain to get a surge in that sort of data. And that will make this debate about access a much higher quality debate. We'll be able to see uh, which schools, which universities help take students with much more greater precision about their backgrounds and much greater understanding where they go afterwards. So I feel optimistic about more people going to university and I also feel optimistic that we will have a better understanding of their routes into university and out from university as the quality of the data underpinning these discussions improves. Thank you all very much for coming along and particular thanks to our panellists for a fascinating session. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>